Hello, beautiful people, and welcome, hi, to what's going to be a Genshin Iceberg video. So, I'm sure you've seen floating around recently, people make an iceberg because there's only a very small portion of icebergs that's actually on the surface because of the way that the ice isn't that much lighter than water. A lot of the iceberg is underwater, right? And so people have been using an image of an iceberg as a format for things that have a few things on the surface, but where there's a lot of more niche knowledge deep down if you go look for it. So I've made an iceberg for Genshin theory crafting and Genshin like knowledge and shit like that. So non-lore stuff. And uh, I'm gonna go through it with you guys today. First level is basically the very, very straightforward, simple stuff. Now, forward versus reverse vape is pretty straightforward. When you trigger vaporize with hydro, it multiplies your damage by two times. And when you trigger it with pyro, it multiplies your damage by 1.5 times. All right, so you've got the forward side, the one that does the bigger multiplier, and then you've got the reverse side. Same for melt. There's other stuff about that but we'll we'll get into it later don't you worry uh skills generate energy which yeah that's uh that's your main form of generating energy for your team is using elemental skills people will often see a character like have their kits say generate energy and they'll be like wow this is so good not realizing that there's other characters that are going to generate more energy just because their skills generate a lot of particles rational is pretty straightforward as well. Rational is just the Raiden national team with Raiden, Shangling, Bennett, Singto, and uh, yeah, that's that. Basically, you add Raiden to a Shangling team and you end up using her Electro application to make Shangling overload and her energy generation to basically not get punished for putting a character on field that isn't Bennett to generate particles. VV is broken because yeah it is vv is pretty fucking broken animo's just broken in general but vv is uh definitely contributing to that crit value is the main way that people use to evaluate the quality of an artifact where they'll look at how much crit rate and crit damage there is and because crit rate you don't get as much of it as crit damage it's as rare it's as whatever but you don't get as much you get half you can multiply your crit rate by two and it's kind of the it, it would be the equivalent of crit damage so if you multiply your crit rate by two and you add it to your crit damage that's the amount of crit value that you have on an artifact right so an artifact like this would have about 25 crit damage seven crit rate so that's 25 plus two times seven so 25 plus 14 which would be 39 crit value an artifact like this doesn't have crit rate so it's only 22 crit value crit value is a pretty good baseline way of evaluating an artifact's quality but once you start learning more about the game you'll realize that there's a lot of stats that are also good and that you might want not necessarily more than crit but you might have an artifact for example i have this artifact and that's two rolls of em and one roll of attack and then it has 33.4 crit value that would generally be better than this that has 45 ish crit value just because at least on characters that can use the em even though it's less crit value and em isn't as good as crit it's more stats in total. And so even though the stat isn't as good, more mediocre stats can beat out less optimal stats. And one to two, so the optimal ratio of crit rate to crit damage for your DPS is going to be one to two because of the fact that you are given crit rate half as much as crit damage. And because they multiply together, the way that you, you, you get the optimal output out of that is a one to two crit ratio. Next up we go to the second level. So you've got energy funneling. So basically your skills do generate energy. They generate energy in the form of elemental particles. And then the way that the game calculates how much energy you gain, you'll generate elemental particles and they'll fly to you. And when you catch them, every single member of your party is going to gain energy. Now the amount that they gain is going to be based on the elemental type of the particles and on whether they're on field or off field when you catch them. So if the particles are the same element as the character, they gain more energy. And if the particles are caught by your character on field, they gain more energy. So what you can do is you can have a character that fulfills a role that people call a battery, whose purpose is to generate energy particles. And then you swap to a character that needs the energy and you catch the particles on that character. So a good example of that would be Diona. When you hold Diona's E, you generate on average four-ish cryo particles, which means that if you put Diona in a team with Ganyu, for example, you can use your hold E on Diona, get four particles, swap the Ganyu, and catch them, and basically generate a lot of energy for Ganyu. That's energy funneling. Snapshotting 
is when you have an ability that keeps doing damage over time that it, it's not just like deals damage once well your stats are going to change over time right because sometimes you have buffs that only last a certain amount of time snapshotting is when the damage of your ability over that duration is based on your stats at the moment you cast it abilities that don't snapshot will do less damage when you lose a buff and do more damage when you gain a buff abilities that snapshot only take your stats when you cast them and deal damage based on those stats for their whole duration so you can use buffs that only buff your on-field character like menat's buff for example with an ability that's not shot like shangling spyronado and you can get the massive attack buff on shangling spyronado and then swap out and still have it on the pyronado multiplicative transformative additive there's three types of reactions in the game those three multiplicative reactions just multiply the damage you do pretty straightforward transformative reactions basically just add an instance of damage that isn't based on how much damage your initial thing did so if you look at stuff like overload if razor triggers overload and if raiden triggers overload and they both have the same stats it will deal the same damage and then additive reactions they're kind of like transformative reactions but they can crit so they scale with your crit damage they scale with your damage percent bonuses and it's not a separate number like transformative reactions are that being said unlike multiplicative reactions you don't like gain more from an additive reaction when you trigger it with a big hit additive reactions are aggravate and spread if you aggravate raiden's burst like the, the initial slash the damage gain from the aggravate will be the same as if you aggravate her normal attack after using her burst attack percent so that's kind of just an expansion on the crit value thing from earlier uh, a lot of people will underestimate the value of attack percent or, or or elemental mastery because it's not as premium of a status crit but the reality is because artifact farming is by design based on rng right it's luck based very very often you'll end up in situations where you have an artifact that has good stats but not that much crit value and it's better than your artifacts that have a lot of crit value because it just has so many good stats that can happen pretty often international so international is child bennett Kazuha Shangling. It gets its name from being a variation of the national team, which national team is Shangling, Bennett, Sucro, Sir Chongyun, and then Singto. And then when Child came out, or a while after Child came out, people started realizing that he worked well with Shangling. And when Kazuha came out, people realized that with Child and Bennett and Kazuha and Shangling, you would have a very good team. And it was pretty similar to the national team because it was still using Bennett, Animal, Hydro, and Sangling to bait your Sangling. But you now had characters from four different nations. Child from Sneznaya, Kazuha from Inazuma, Bennett from Mondstadt slash not really Mondstadt. He was raised in Mondstadt, but he was found in a fucking volcano or something. He's probably from Natlin, but I'm sure we'll find out more about it once we get to Natlin. <laughs> and then Sangling from Liyue. So that's four characters from different regions. It was one of the first teams because at the time Inazuma wasn't even out. So we didn't even have three regions. We only have Monsat and Liyue, but because Child is a Harbinger from Sesnaya and because Kazuha came out in 1.6 before Inazuma, then it was basically the only real team that we could make at the time that had characters from four different nations. And it happened to be a really good one that is still good to this day. And so people called it international and the name stuck around. And then finally, ER is the best stat until it's not. <laughs> basically, a lot of characters rely on their burst to do their damage and if you don't have enough energy to cast your burst when you want it they're okay. fucking useless but once you have enough energy recharge to get enough energy when you want to use it getting more energy recharge is completely useless and so energy recharge has a very like large disparity in how good it is depending on what your current stats are if you don't have enough to use your burst on a character that wants to use their burst is the best stat in the game and if you already have enough it's completely useless. <laughs> All right, next level. We get into more obscure things that in order to know, you'll need to either have been here for a while or be a little bit into theory crafting. So the first one is chest respawn. I think we can group chests respawn and AR42 together. When the game initially came out, there was obviously a learning curve for people learning the game. And many people, while we were still in the early stages, kind of just bullshitted and they could get away with it because people didn't know better we didn't know what the fuck okay. was happening back then and so people made up a bunch of bullshit that just had no basis in reality whatsoever and a lot of people started actually believing it and uh one of them was chests respawning which they don't uh the actual mechanic is that new chests spawn in your world when your adventure rank increases now it's not the same chests 
and they'll spawn whether you've gotten all your chests or not which means that there's never like an incentive to do a chest route and then you'll get them again but uh but yeah and then ar-42 is people used to say that you would get a free ayaka at ar-42 once ayaka came out that was not true <laughs> <laughs> rotations rotations is generally gonna be the best way to play difficult content in the game where you figure out a certain order for your abilities that basically feeds back into itself where you basically you look at your cooldowns you look at all the things you have you want to be able to use you figure out the order in which you want to use them and then you make a rotation and then you rotate back to the beginning every time you're done that generally leads to getting your dps pretty high to, pretty close to the theoretical maximum if you play them well icd or internal cooldown some abilities and skills and normal attacks and bursts whatever that deal elemental damage can trigger reaction and they can apply elements the thing is they don't always trigger reactions or apply elements there's a thing called internal cooldown that basically prevents you from being able to trigger reaction with every hit what it does for the game is it creates room for characters that have multi-hit things that don't just inherently become fucking broken because that just means they can trigger more reaction than others and it also it basically it creates another layer of balance that the devs can use to try to keep their game a bit more balanced which they've been doing pretty well so far but the the general rule of internal cooldown is a little bit complicated but it's generally once every three once every two to three hits is gonna apply an element some abilities do not have internal cooldown because internal cooldown by design is the cooldown for the same thing to apply its element but some things are programmed to not be the same thing when they hit multiple times so for example Changling's pyronado once you've done your three hit wind up right it's not going to treat a given rotation as the same hit as the last one and so it doesn't have an internal cooldown Gwoba swirl there's a mechanic in the game where Gwoba actually applies pyro to himself when he starts firing once he gets this exclamation po exclamation point right here the exclamation mark he has pyro on himself you can actually use that to swirl off of Gwoba but only with sucrose's e why nobody fucking knows but sucrose's e specifically can trigger swirl using Gwoba. Other animal characters can use it to get their elemental absorption, but it won't swirl Pyro. So I do get the Pyro infusion, but there was no swirl. There was no swirl. Visual effect, no swirl. Reaction limit. Reaction limit describes the limit on reactions from a specific source. So a lot of reactions have aoe which means that if you trigger it on two different enemies at the same time, then well you'll get two aoe hits and when you got two aoe hits then that's two instances of damage on each character right it should be quadratic but reactions have a limit to how many hits a target can take from the same source for a reaction in a given amount of time so that limit is up to two instances every 0.5 seconds so what that means is if i go somewhere where there's three enemies like in this domain So you can see that there's four C's on the ground, but when they explode, the enemies don't take four instances of damage because Bloom is limited to two. A lot of reactions have that. Overloaded is limited at one. Superconduct two, Bloom two, Swirl two, Virgin two, Hyper Bloom two, because Hyper Bloom does have a little bit of an AOE. But when it comes to Bloom, Virgin, Hyper Bloom, it's not just an AOE. In single target, if you generate a lot of C's and detonate them all at the same time, even on one enemy, you'll only get two instances of damage. Next level. We're starting to get into deeper shit. Elemental gauge theory. Elemental gauge theory is basically when you apply an element to an enemy, it's not just like a yes, no thing of do they have a hydro on them, for example. It's also a how much. So it's not just enemy has hydro or enemy doesn't. It's enemy doesn't have hydro or enemy has X amount of hydro and elemental gauge theory is basically what encompasses all of that all of the numbers how different reactions can make those numbers interact how much element you have on the enemy forward versus reverse bloom so that's one of the many things that's covered by elemental gauge theory when you trigger reactions right like i said the way that the elements interact with each other isn't always going to be the same so for example if i use barbara 
normal attack and charge attack into Dendroman character E, I'll get one bloom reaction. If I do it the other way around, oops, there we go. I'll get two bloom reactions because bloom has a forward and a reverse side and the forward side removes more the reason why people call it forward and reverse bloom is because the same mechanic also applies to vaporize and melt so let's use two things two abilities that apply the same amount of units so kaya and bennett e are both two units if i do kaya e into bennett e it removes all of it but if I do it the other way around, Bennett E into Kaya E, there's still some Pyro left. And the forward side of Melt, and the forward side of Vaporize, right? So in Melt, Pyro onto, onto Cryo removes more. And so Bloom has that same mechanic, except without the increased damage when you trigger a forward side. Reverse reactions are almost always better, because since they remove less, it means that you can more easily keep the unit triggering the reaction consistent so you don't have to build both of the units on their reactions you can build one unit on their base talent stuff and one unit on their reactions so generally reverse stuff is better double auras so there are a few elements that either don't react together or that react together in a way that lets you have more than one aura on an enemy at the same time first example is electro charge that lets you have Electro and Hydro on an enemy at the same time. Here, it doesn't last very long because we're only applying one unit of Electro and one unit of Hydro. But if you were to use units that apply more, so Beto's E applies two units of Electro and Child's E applies two units of Hydro, you can make it last longer. When it comes to uh, Cryo and Dendro, you can do the same thing. Except in Quayo and Dendro's case, there's no reaction at all, so they'll just last however long they're supposed to. Those double auras can be used to trigger double reactions. So if I get Beto's E and Child's E, I'll have Electro charged, but I'll also have two auras on the enemy, which means that if I Bennett E, I'll get overloaded and vaporized. Same thing with Cryo and Dendro. I can get Melt and Burning. And using those double reactions like that is one of the ways that you can abuse a lot of the reaction stuff to create some pretty good teams. Reaction auras. When I hit an enemy with Dendro and then Electro, I'll trigger Quicken. But Quicken has an aura. And this, even though it shows Dendro, isn't a real Dendro aura, right? You can see the visual effect is green lightning. It's not the... the green leaves that you get from just dendro right right it's not the green leaves it's green lightning if you trigger quicken and then attack an enemy with electro you'll trigger aggravate and that's it but then you'll be able to have because this is a reaction aura and it's a Quicken Aura, you can have a double aura with Quicken and Electro. But if you do something similar, but you apply Dendro before, you'll trigger Quicken again with the underlying Dendro because we had a double aura of Quicken and Dendro. And because of that, our Electro doesn't actually make it to the enemy as an aura. <laughs> A few reactions actually create auras on enemies, so there's Quicken that does it, there's Frozen that does it, and there's uh, Burning that does it. I think that's it. But yeah, so you can use these reaction auras to abuse a bunch of mechanics. So, for example, if I get just Quicken, I don't get an Electro, so if I use my Kazuha E, I don't swirl anything. But if, if instead of applying Electro onto a Dendro aura, I apply it on a Quicken aura, Then I get an underlying Electro, and then I can Swirl it. And I get my BV bonus, I get my Swirl reaction damage, I get whatever benefits you get from your character, like Kazuha with his Ascension passive. But yeah, hit lag extension. If I use my Hu Tao E, let's see when the, the timer expires. So at around 6.5 or 7, closer to 7-ish, the E expires. However, if I'm hitting an enemy,
We still get it, and it ends at around 5-ish instead. So the reason for that is because when you hit enemies, there's a very, very small, not lag, but freeze of that enemy. That enemy gets slightly frozen for a few milliseconds, right? A few frames, which are 60th of seconds if you play at 60 FPS. While that's happening, right, which people will call hit lag, while that's happening, a lot of things actually get paused or a lot of timers stop ticking down. And Hu Tao's E infusion, Hu Tao's E like buff, is one such timer. There are a lot of buffs that end up that you can extend by using hit lag. It's a lot easier to notice hit lag when you're against enemies that have shields because hit lag against shields is a lot larger than hit lag against normal enemies. But if you've ever noticed that when you go in co-op, the enemies feel like they're a little bit more slow, that's why. Because usually, the only character that has hit lag or that provides hit lag for your team is your on-field character. But when you have four on-field characters that are all getting hit lag, that enemy gets slowed down quite a bit, actually. And it becomes very noticeable. All this to say, you can use hit lag to extend the duration of a lot of your abilities, and that makes it so that a very, very large amount of buffs lasts longer than what it says on the ability description. Hu Tao's E does not last 9 seconds if you're hitting enemies. It lasts closer to 10, up to 11-ish. Potentially more if you're hitting a shield. Raiden's Burst, Sino's Burst. If you've ever noticed that you're still inside of Sino's Burst, but your cooldown is back, right? Even though it's supposed to last 10 plus 8, right? Because you can get two of these. It's supposed to last 18 seconds of the 20 second cooldown, but you get your burst back before it's over. That's why. It's because hit lag extended the duration of his burst. Finally, on this level, we have Elemental Absorption Priority. A lot of animal characters have an ability that can absorb an element. What happens if it comes into contact with two elements at the same time? Well, there's a priority. The priority for most animal characters is Pyro first, then Hydro, then Electro, then Cryo. P-H-E-C. Feck. Why is the game putting them in a different order in the descriptions? No idea. That's so weird. We can actually show this very well right here. Ooh, what the fuck? So as you can see, right, this guy has Electro on him. So if I use my Kazuha uh, E, or my Kazuha Burst, it should infuse with Electro, right? Well, no, because this enemy has a Torch infused with Pyro, so if I hold E, I get the Pyro infusion. There is one exception to that priority, and it's animal main character who has a different priority for some fucking reason. I don't know why. It's the same, but with Cryo first. So you still have Pyro, Hydro, and Electro, but instead of having Cryo last, you have Cryo first. All right, next up, even deeper into the iceberg. You might be wondering, why is Sucrose normal attack one here, huh? Well, Sugros has a bug where sometimes her normal attack doesn't go through. As far as I understand, it's based on like the input or what you input after it. But sometimes Sugros' normal attack just doesn't go through. And then you don't get your swirl and you're, you're, you're just sitting there sad. Mona's Constellation 1 also has a bug. We go read Mona's Constellation 1. It has a few effects, one of which being frozen duration is extended by 15%. This is a lie. It does not do anything to frozen duration. It literally does not do that. This is a lie. Uh, I've seen a lot of people try to correct others and say that it does work, but only if she's the one to trigger a reaction or something. And people would get to that conclusion because frozen duration is decided by gauge theory. It's decided by the quantity of cryo and hydro you apply and in which order. And so if you don't know that and you start with, I don't know, K as E, into Mona's Burst, it's gonna last a pretty decent amount of time, and you're gonna be like, well, it lasts longer if I do Mona Burst second then. The thing is, if you did Barbara Normal Attack instead of Mona's Burst, it would last the same amount of time. This frozen duration extended by 15% is a lie. It isn't actually happening. It doesn't happen. It's just, it's not true. All right, next up, Double VV. Viridescent Venerer, the Animo set that reduces resistance to the element infused by your swirl when you trigger a swirl. The thing is, while this can't stack with itself, it can stack with other elements, which means that you can reduce the resistance to more than one element at a time. Now, 
in your rotations, when you end up using an animal character with other characters of different elements, ideally, you're going to want to be able to trigger a swirl on both of the elemental types you have. That way, all of your damage gets that 27-ish percent additional damage that you get from reducing resistance by 40 percent. Something went wrong. <laughs> Wait till you see the... <laughs> Let's fix that, shall we? So, let's do that again, but with Viridess and Venner on our fucking character this time. Right? If I do the normal setup... Right, very cool. My burst hits for 106k. Because I didn't swirl Hydra. But if I adopt my setup a little bit, to get a Hydro Swirl and a Pyro Swirl... My burst instead deals 170k, which is quite a lot more fucking damage, actually. Right? It's a pretty large difference. But yeah, so getting your double swirls can be pretty important. Dragon Strike! We talked about hit lag a little bit, right? But there's another thing that's paused during hit lag, and that's vertical momentum, which means if you jump while hit lag is happening, with a lot of speed, you're gonna jump a little bit higher. And you can actually make it so that you jump high enough to be able to do a plunge attack. That was a good first combo. That was a pretty good first combo. Holy. Now, the thing about this is, in order to do it well, you're often gonna need a lot of movement speed, which is why I swap my team to double animal for animal resonance plus Diona. I can do it without Diona. Uh, without the animal resonance or Diona, it starts being very difficult for me. Some characters can only do it with movement speed buffs. I think Jaluk can do it without, but it's very, very, like, tight. This is what people call Dragon Strike because, I don't know, it's a bad name, I hate it. <laughs> Dragon Strike is generally, if you can do it, the optimal combo, but it's really fucking hard to do, so it's like, this, you know? But beca because plunge attacks generally just deal a lot of damage, right? Plunge attack, uh, 153 plus 306 is what we get. You still. Versus only 153 from the first hit. It's like three instances of your first hit, and it doesn't have ICD. So it's gonna vape if you can vape. When it comes to doing Dragon Strike, you want a character that has long hit lag for their attack. So Claymores are generally best for it because Claymores are big weapons. And so in order to make the hits feel heavy, they are very often given longer hit lag. And then you want as much movement speed as possible. So generally taller characters are better, which is why I'm doing it with Duluth because Duluth is a tall Claymore character. Yeah, right um these are obviously not like necessarily all that great teams but it's cool if you can do it wave dashing fuck that's even harder to show oh why why am i doing this to myself when there is an updraft which you can generate like in abyss with venti's hold e i'm gonna change to 30 fps because it makes it easier sorry for the well yeah 30 fps right I mean, I did it the first time, but... Fuck. You can basically jump and then glide, but glide early enough that your feet are still on the ground, and so your glide gets cancelled. So basically, you can cancel a jump. The thing is, a lot of combos, for example with Hu Tao, you generally want to cancel with jumps and so you can use this mechanic wave dashing to jump cancel something and then wave dash cancel your jump and basically get a significantly faster jump cancel there we go it makes your cancels instant like literally one frame cancel instead of having a jump that takes like 20 frames 
you literally get a one frame cancel. It is actually frame perfect, which is why going to 30 FPS helps. Because instead of having a 60th of a second, you have a 30th of a second pog. All right. And finally in this year, we have book. They unfortunately patched out a lot of the book tricks. But when you press F1 and open your adventurer's handbook or another menu, but people have been using the handbook for it, it pauses the game, right? Well, not really. There's a few things that actually still take down when you're inside your book, when you're booking. You used to be able to use the book trick to let internal cooldown expire. So basically you could book between your attacks to basically pretend you didn't have internal cooldown. That being said, that's a fucking pain in the ass because you'd have to do it a lot. One mechanic that you can still do with booking is you can book elemental particles. So it's gonna happen very often that you want to cast your skill on a character and you want them to cast the particles, but you also want to swap out right after. The thing is, if you swap out right after, well, someone else catches the particles and you don't get them, and that sucks. So one thing you can do is you can book particles. So we gain the particles. We did catch the particles and our, our abyss timer didn't go down even though we stayed on the character to, to, to catch them. So you can book particles. Uh, some people do it in speedruns that allow for pauses. The main practical use of booking is to get the particles back if the enemies are about to die because otherwise you just lose them. Now, I think in one of the recent, the 3.0 Genshin Championship thing, they did use that trick. I think 1010 made a video about it. Hello, welcome back. Shut up. So they use Ayaka's burst. They swap to Shenha to do the double E with constellations. They swap back to Ayaka to catch the particles. But the enemy is about to fucking die because this, this is a whale Ayaka. So what do they do? They book. So they can catch the particles and then kill it. It actually has a practical use. Next up, elemental durability. So I've talked about the amount of an element that gets applied to an element, uh, to an enemy when you use elemental abilities. And I've, I've used one unit, two units, all that. The reality is that's not actually how it works. It's just a, like a way to communicate it that's easy to understand. The actual way that it works is with durability and it's with like actual big numbers and it's a pain in the ass. And honestly, I don't understand it well enough to explain it. I just know it's there and that there's no fucking reason for me to figure it out because it doesn't matter. <laughs> But the way that it actually works within the game's code is with elemental durability and not with gauge units. And if you talk to data miners, data miners often use elemental durability to talk about gauge and not gauge. Weapon gauge. There are a few characters that let you infuse your weapon with an element. Here's the thing though. The way that elemental infusions work when you have more than one at the same time is with reactions, which means that because pyro on, on cryo is strong side, if I end up with Cryo and Pyro. I'll stay with a Pyro infusion for basically the whole duration. All right, if I use Elemental Sight, you can see that my weapon is applied with Pyro. If I do it with Hydro instead, instead of Cryo, because Hydro on, on Pyro is the strong side, you'll you keep. Still. A Hydro Aura on your weapon, weapon. because Hydro on Pyro is the strong side. But if you end up using all three... Hydro, oh, Pyro. Uh oh, oh, Hydro. Wait, oh, Hydro, okay. Oh, Physical, Hydro. Oh, Pyro. Oh, Hydro. Oh, oh, Hydro, cro oh, oh, Physical. Okay, we're back to Physical. <laughs> because you don't have a clear... Well winner anymore there's no clear like reaction that has priority over the other then it just starts alternating between all of them because you just end up having a bunch of reactions that change which is your currently active one you can add katsing if you want her infusion works a little bit differently but we're getting a lot of hydro here most of the time, this is completely useless. But the fact that you trigger a reaction is relevant. The reason why it's relevant is because if the reaction you trigger is a reaction that has AoE, you can trigger overload on them. If you overload your weapon, it 
does a Lee, and so it deals damage. Now, with Overload, it doesn't really matter that much, because you're probably going to get a bunch of Overloads if you have Bennett and Kutzing on your stuff anyways. But, where it can actually matter is if you have C6 Kazuha, and he applies Animo to your weapon, inside of Bennett's Burst, you can use your self-weapon infusion to swirl Pyro without needing to apply Pyro to the enemies. <laughs> It's kind of like, it's Kazuha's version of a Guoba swirl, basically. Instead of, of swirling Guoba, he swirls your weapon. All right, simultaneous reaction priority. When you have two elements on an enemy, I've talked about how you can use that to trigger two reactions, right? The thing is, you won't always trigger two reactions. Sometimes, you'll only trigger one. So if I do, Child E into Beto E into Yanfei normal attack, I only get an Overloaded. I don't get a Vaporize. The reason for that is because in order to react with the second element, you must first react with the first. And if you don't apply enough element to remove the first element, so if I do Beto E into Yunfei normal attack, there's still some Electro left. So Yunfei's normal attack isn't enough to remove all of Beto's Electro. So if you don't remove the Electro, your Pyro doesn't make it to the Hydro and you don't trigger Vaporize. Now this has a pretty significant gameplay relevance against electro-infused enemies because it means that when you're against an electro-infused enemy you can't vape you'll be able to apply hydro to them Whatever. right we can see some overloads and some electro charge but no vapes! Another, like, important implication of it is Cryo and Dendro. There we go. So, with one normal attack from Nahida, we can get three seeds. Uh, if we don't use the Cryo, we'll only get two. And we can only get two. Because you need to go through the Cryo first in order to get to the Dendro with, uh, with Freeze and Bloom, then that means that you're removing less Dendro. And when you remove less Dendro, that means you can trigger more reactions with your Dendro. And so you can use simultaneous reaction priority for stuff like that to increase the amount of reactions you get. Although most of the time, simultaneous reaction priority is just going to be a pain in the ass for you when you're trying to vape on an Electro enemy. All right, International second rotation. So International is a pretty popular team, but people very often have no fucking clue what to do once they get to the second rotation. Because International's rotation, the first rotation, uses child's e to set up your double swirl but when you get to the second rotation his e is on cooldown from well being in melee stance for a while main reason for that is because it's such a good team that you just don't get to the second rotation a lot of the time so most people don't bother learning it uh, but let's show what happens on the second rotation so first rotation pretty cool mm -hmm. i'm not gonna use kazuha's burst because i'm in single target You can use your charge attack like that to apply your hydro and get your double swirl. This is gonna hurt. Very cool. So you can use it with your charge shot after Bennett burst instead of your E before Bennett burst. Finally, in this in this tier, we have a Ningguang. Now, the reason why it's just Ningguang is because Ningguang has like two deep iceberg things about her. Uh, the first one, look at her character model. She does this oh this oh this 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 oh a twirl this here's the thing the actual animation she uses is rng and one of the animations is slower than the others which means that the actual dps that ningguang does is rng <laughs> when you get the swirl the twirl it's a dps loss but not only that but it can fuck up your timing for her charge attack because if you just do, I, I, I'll do it, right? Double clicked and hold, it doesn't actually do the charge attack. If you wait a bit, it does it. Sometimes you're gonna miss your Ningguang charge attack because you're used to the timing of one of them and then it just doesn't do it. Anyways, it's not a big difference, but it's just enough that it's noticeable 
when you play her a lot. There's another thing about Ningguang. I want to show you guys something. I'm sure you've heard of Sax or Sing Cho. It lets you generate your particles twice. So what happens if you do it with Ningguang? Okay, we get our particles. Sick. Particles mod check? The second and the third didn't generate particles. Because Ningguang has a six second internal cooldown on particle generation. For whatever the fuck reason. I don't know why. You can't do E, E, E like you should be able to to generate three sets of particles. The reason why you can do E, E, E is because your first E proc sac frag. Your second E destroys your first E because you can only have one at a time. And that procs your C2, which resets your cooldown. And then your third E, well, yeah. But you only get the, the particles once because Hoyoverse hates you. And then one that I actually didn't... I, I kind of like for gore I put there. TF is an animo set. So Thundering Fury increases damage caused by overloaded Electrocharge, Superconduct, and Hyper Bloom by 40%, and damage bonus conferred by Aggravate is increased by 20%. When Quicken or the aforementioned elemental reactions are triggered, and el elemental skill is decreased by one second. You might notice that that's all of the electro reactions except two. There's no crystallize and there's no swirl. So why would you put it on an animo unit? Well, here's the thing, okay? When you trigger swirl, it spreads electro or it applies electro to nearby enemies and when you apply electro to nearby enemies that electro can trigger reactions which means that your swirl can trigger chain reactions so as you can see we can use TF on animal units. <laughs> it does work if your swirl chain reaction triggers another reaction. In this case, Aggravate. Uh, and if you can actually get it to work, TF is pretty fucking good on Kazuha. Before Aggravate came out, you could still do this with Electro Charge, but we didn't really have an Electro unit that cared about TF very much, which meant that the actual best users for TF, none of them were actual Electro units, which was just really funny. <laughs> All right, next up, we get into like some pretty deep fucking shit. Uh, let's start with Abyss attack patterns. The way that enemy attack patterns work is basically they'll have a list of melee attack patterns and a list of range attack patterns. Some of their attack patterns also have additional conditions. For example, there's a few enemies that can't do the same attack twice. You look at, for example, the Primo Geovisha, he's not gonna do the any of his attack except one twice in a row. The one attack that you can get him to do twice in a row is the one that he does when you're behind him. You can actually get him to do it over and over and over and over. So if you stay behind him, he just chains that attack over and over and over again. As long as you're not too far behind him. Sometimes he breaks. <laughs> right, but a lot of enemies have conditions on their attack patterns and all that. However, very often when Hoyoverse puts enemies in Abyss, they know that certain attack patterns would impact your experience in a way that they don't want. And so they change the rules or they change the conditions for the enemy's pattern. A very good example that is actually in Abyss right now is the first attack that the Aeon Blight Drake does when he gets up. Because in Abyss, they change his attack pattern for him to always start by taking flight. Whereas in, in Overworld, when you encounter him, the first thing he does when he gets up is, well, not flying. And he actually doesn't start flying until a pretty long while into the fight, which effectively forces you to have on your team a way to bring him down. Another example of what they did is previous Abyss, they did they did it with Simon. Simon's first attack pattern when you encounter him in Overworld is the weird like laser thing where he launches a bunch of lasers at you. In Abyss, he would skip that attack entirely because it gets him to his invisible phase faster. So they're using, they're changing the enemy's attack patterns in Abyss in order to try to force you to bring specific things, right? So you can see, right? This is always the first attack pattern he does in Overworld, but he won't start with that in Abyss. Next up, Abyss Mage types. If I go into the Noblesse Domain and I attack the Cryo Abyss Mage, I crystallize it, nothing happens. Look at my health bar, 
Nothing crazy, nothing special here. If instead, I go to the peak of whatever in Dragonspine, the Blizzard Slayer domain, if I attack this dude, I get Cryo on me. This Abyss Mage has thorns. Abyss Mages have different types that can give them additional effects. For example, right, some Cryo Abyss Mages, when the crystal falls down, it leaves a, like, ice mist. Some it doesn't. Some have thorns. Some don't. You can't know until you actually fight it. Now, in this case, it's very relevant because them having thorns like that means that if you attack two different Abyss Mages at the same time of different elements, and they both have thorns, you'll trigger reactions on yourself. And if it's a Hydro and an Electro one, you'll trigger Electro Charge on yourself. And you're gonna f***ing die! Now, there was an Abyss a few months ago, where on floor 11, there was a Hydro and an Electro Mage that both had thorns. And so whenever I played Kazuha against that, I would just fucking kill myself in game. Like, actually in game. And it's like, huh? That's how I found out. But it can also mean that you can freeze yourself if it's a Hydro and a Cryo one, so be careful. Singcho nerf in patch 1.0 with Klee's release. Singcho's swords applied Hydro on each hit. He did not have internal cooldown. They realized, huh, this kind of limits our options in terms of design. He's too good. And so they nerfed him and they removed that interaction in patch 1.1, which made him not work well with Klee anymore. And uh, yeah, so that was a massive nerf and still he's like basically the best unit in the game. To be fair though, Tinsu in patch 1.0 was a little bit too strong. So let's get into unlimited blade works. Cause here's another thing Tinsu could do in 1.0. Understandable nerf. Next up, Petra Bennett. So, you might be thinking, why the fuck would you ever put the Geo set on Bennett? Here's the thing, Timmy. I can pick up a crystal like that. So, if you put a character on your slot one with the four piece Petra set, and you generate crystals on the previous chamber, you can effectively gain a 35% damage bonus to whichever element you want to set up with without needing a Geo character on the second half. Now, in casual play, it doesn't do anything, but some people like speedrunning, and when you want to speedrun the second chamber of a floor, setting it up so that Bennett can gain the Petra crystal and wear the four-piece Petra set will increase the speed of your clear a lot more than a 4 beast and a blessed would because the 35% damage bonus is a lot better than 20% attack. Finally, we have ducking the rune guard spin. So, some attacks are coded in a way that assumes that you're fighting on a flat plane. So when you fight on a slope, some pretty weird shit can end up happening. I think he's gonna do it now, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah does it only work with tiny characters it, your hitbox can get too high it yeah, depends on the it normally due to his height <laughs> true let's get into the deepest level i'd say that on average the people that are watching this on twitch right now which is generally a bit more a bit less casual than youtube probably on average know like maybe three of these six. Let's start with Bote. Bote is one of the one of the theory crafters in KQM, and I did not think it was possible for one person to have this much talent at a video game. Any sort of like difficult stuff that you can think of that, that we've talked about already, Bote has a showcase of it that wasn't done with a macro. I'm sure we can find Bote Wave Dash. Not human. Literally not human. This is not with a macro, by the way. Next up, let's talk about zone levels. Different places on the map actually have different levels. And you can know that because when you get burnt by grass in Mondstadt, it doesn't do the same damage as when you get burnt by grass in Liyue. So here it's 77. 
Oh, 104? Haven't, I haven't actually looked into zone levels since Sumeru came out, so I don't know if this is higher. Oh, 117! Damn. Yeah, so these are zone levels. Next up, People Tub. <laughs> People dub! Horizontal impact. There used to be a bug that they patched out where if in the teapot you put a fruit stand at a specific angle and you clipped it in a rock, you would then be able to have your climbing kind of get weirded out and you'd climb on top of it and then it would do the giddy up animation and you would end up horizontally like with your feet on, on the vertical thing and what you could do from here is you could still use your skills and your bursts. Good times. And that one, that one is special to me because while you could like get horizontal in a few different ways, I actually found it myself the specific way of doing it in the teapot with the fruit stand. It was a complete accident. I was just putting as much shit into my teapot as possible just so I could get my teapot level to be higher to get more teapot currency and at some point I just tried to climb it and I realized oh my god what the fuck is happening I'm horizontal now <laughs> so it has a bit of a, a bit of a special place in my heart because of that <laughs> what the fuck what is this what the all right fuck calm is down this? buddy <laughs> Real-time oh reaction. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've only got two left. Second to last is the rock. I don't know if I have a rock left somewhere. Is it this? It is! We found the rock! So there is like a rock that can take damage uh, and you can kill the rock. And once you kill your rock, it doesn't respawn. Now my rock's dead, and it will never respawn. And then let's kill this one too. It will never be back. The rock has no impact on your actual game, but it's funny. And yeah, so that's the rock. And then finally, we're on to the last piece of the Genshin Iceberg, the very, very bottom that only the smartest of theory crafters know, the sub trick. Indeed, if you subscribe to my channel on YouTube, ZJeff77, you will immediately start doing 5% more damage across all of your accounts. Listen, you, you don't trust me, right? You think I'm lying, right? I'm unsubscribed, right? So, 336 on a non-crit, okay, I go, I subscribe to ZJeff, and then, Damn. 417 and 1151. It works. That was more than 5% because um, it knows I'm the Jeff, so it's like giving me a, a bit more. I promise it is not the bell giving me damage. All right, it was just more damage because I subscribed. And so should you. Leave a like, whatever, all that. And uh, have a great rest of your day, YouTube. Yeah, I actually don't know what this one is about. You can't escape Yinzin. It's a meme from your Discord? Oh, shit. My bad. <laughs>